I'm Robbie. Yeah, um, I'm an engineer in uh, Google, and I'm going to talk to you about how to leverage um, TF text for your preprocessing and language models inside of TensorFlow. So, the, for those unfamiliar with language models, um, all right, there we go forward. Um, they're basically everywhere. You use them in query understanding. Um, you have related keyword searches. Um, article summaries, spell check, autocomplete, text-to-speech, spam filters, chatbots. You, you really can't get away from them. And it's really a good time to be into NLP right now because we're going through somewhat of a renaissance. Uh, last year, this paper on Barrett was released that uses attention and transformers. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into it other than uh, traditionally, um, obviously, I mean, when you're working with text, uh, models don't play as well with strings, um, so you convert those into numbers. And so we've used embeddings, uh, different ways to embed, like Glove, Elmo, word to vec are different ways to create vector representations of your words. And uh, these worked really pretty well. Um, the one problem is you have with some words, when you look them up in your vocab, like bat, am I talking about an animal? Am I talking about baseball equipment? Um, even words that don't sound the same, uh, entrance and entrance, they're spelled the exact same. So when you're trying to represent these as a vector, um, you're getting, you're trying to have two different me meanings to the same sequence of letters. And so BERT has got, gone around this by, it's a model that actually uses the context of the sentence to actually create this vector for the words. And so it's done really well, and this is the Stanford question and answer data set. So BERT was late 2018. Um, the scores before that were in the low 70s. It came out, it jumped up to around 82, and ever since then, um, people have been iterating on this model um, through Roberta, Excelnet, Albert, and um, I pulled the scores up. Um, yeah. Um, from last week, and you can see that like the most recent model, Albert, is actually outperforming humans. Um, so that's pretty crazy. So it's really exciting right now to be into this. And so let's just jump right in. Um, so what is TF Text? Um, our charter was basically to make programming uh, these language models in TensorFlow easier. Um, traditionally, it's been very difficult to do this. Um, you would get, let's say you have some data, like here's an example of queries, and we want to train on this data, right? Well, before we can do that, we need to do some preprocessing, uh, which is basically tokenization outside of that because we didn't have that availability inside of TensorFlow. And then once we did this preprocessing, uh, we had to somehow fit it into a tensor, so um, we would get this preprocessed text, uh, add it into the graph, and then um, normally like pad out our tensors to make them a uniform shape um, so they're available. And then we finally train our model, and we go to publish it, and we put it on our model server, and we're like, okay, we're ready to go, right? Um, uh, and then so when we get the serving data, well, you can't just plug that serving data right in, right? Um, we had this preprocessing that has to happen, and so either you're relying on the client to transform the data as well, or you're doing it yourself, and a lot of times it's a different language than what you did your normal scripts in. And I've seen it even like when the pre-processing is exactly the same, like it's used the exact same regex, like because it's different libraries, like one might consider a character class to be punctuation where the other doesn't. And so you get training skew when these like pre-processing steps are different. Um, and so when you actually go to serve the model, you don't have the same performance, and um, that's problematic, right? So um, our charter was to make this as easy as possible to support TensorFlow or to support text inside of TensorFlow. And to do this, we want to do all the text processing in graph. Um, and through, we do this through a series of like text uh, and sequential APIs that were not available, and actually create um, a new tensor type called ragged tensors that better represents this text. So if we go back to when it was painful, uh, what we really want to do is just get rid of this preprocessing step, right? Put everything in the graph. And so 
All your pre-processing happens in graph, and then when you go to serve the model, you're not relying on the client to perform that same, those same steps when you serve the model, and they call it. And so, uh, really the main thing that was missing was tokenization. So last year, uh, we had an RFC uh, with the tokenizer API, and we wanted to make this uh, as easy as possible and straightforward. So it's very simple, it's an abstract tokenizer class, has one method tokenize, it takes input of string and gives you back um, your tokens. And so if you see this, it's, it's very simple. We have a couple sentences here, we tokenize them into words. Um, the one thing I, li I like to point out, uh, which is not completely obvious immediately until you see examples, is that uh, our input is a rank one tensor, and our output is a rank two. Uh, the reason why this is, is our tokens are grouped by the string that they're split from. And so it's really easy uh, from the user, the engineer's perspective to be able to tell which string tokens were pulled from which string in the original tensor. Um, the one thing you can't do from this output is tell where in that originating string it came from. And for that, uh, we have like one extra uh, tokenizer with offsets class, abstract class, that has tokenizer with offsets, which is the same thing. Um, you give it an input uh, tensor of strings, it gives you your tokens, but also gives you where those tokens start and end. Um, so we can see that example here. We call it tokenize with offsets, and we can see the letters um, like I starts at zero and moves one position, and then no is in the second position and moves up six characters. So um, through these offsets, if you want to know where the tokens are in your originating string, you can do that. Uh, and in the, um, you'll notice the shapes are exactly the same as the shapes of the token. So uh, mapping uh, token to starts and limits is very simple from here. And so we provide um, five basic tokenizers. Um, you know, one of the questions when we first did the RFC was, why don't we just have one and like one tokenizer to rule them all? Um, the problem is w every model is different. Uh, you have different uh, limitations and things you want to get around, and we don't want to like push our opinion on you because they're all different. Uh, we just want to build the tools and allow you to make the decision. And so. Um, a lot of these are very simple. Uh, the white space obviously just splits a sentence on white space. Uh, Unicode script, so if you know Unicode, uh, characters are grouped together in what they call Unicode scripts. Um, so you would have like Latin characters, uh, Greek, um, Arabic, uh, Japanese are just some examples. And then they also group spaces, punctuation, and uh, numbers as well. And so it splits on those. Um, I would say in the most simple case, if you're just working with English, the main difference between white space is it splits out the punctuation. Um, so word piece, uh, this was popularized by the BERT model, which I had mentioned earlier. It basically takes uh, text that you've already tokenized and then splits those words into even uh, smaller subword units. Um, so this is actually, it greatly reduces the size of your vocabulary as you're trying to encapsulate more information, uh, your vocabulary will grow. Uh, and by actually breaking the words down into subword units, you can greatly uh, get that smaller and encapsulate more meaning and uh, less data. And to generate the vocab, we, we have a Beam pipeline in our GitHub, so you can generate your own. Um, or uh, the original BERT model has a vocab you can use. Um, sentence piece is a very popular tokenizer. Um, so this is actually released uh, previously. There's a GitHub uh, where people have downloaded it and it's uh, pretty popular. Basically it takes a configuration where you set up a bunch of pre-processing uh, steps already and you feed that to it and it does that. And so it does subword uh, tokenization, word and character. And finally we're releasing a BERT one it does all the pre-processing that the original BERT paper did, and so you can use, like I said, their WordPiece tokenization, and it'll like 
It'll do the pre-tokenization pre steps, some other normalization, and then the word piece tokenization. So now that we had tokenizers, we really just uh, needed a way to represent these. And uh, that's where we created ragged tensors um, for this better representation of text. So if we look at an example, uh, we have two sentences. And like I said, like normally your sentences are never of the same length. Um, so when you try and create a tensor out of these, you get a value error. Like it needs to be of a uniform shape. And so traditionally, like I said previously, uh, we padded out the strings. Um, and in this example, you, you're like, OK, so three extra values is not so bad. Uh, but when you're actually writing out these models, um, you don't know how long your sentences are going to be. So you have a fixed size. And so a lot of times you've seen like fixed size of 128 characters or 128 words. And your just pad has like all this extra information that like you don't really need inside your tensor. Uh, and then you, if you try and make that smaller, when you do have a long sentence, then those sentences are truncated. So you may think, well, we have sparse tensor. Um, and this is also not quite as good, because there's a lot of waste of data that you're having to supply a sparse tensor. Um, as you know, or, sh or if you don't, um, sparse tensors, because really in TensorFlow, everything's made of tensors. So it's actually made of three tensors, which is values, a shape, and then where those values exist within your uh, matrix shape. And so you can see that like, there's actually a pattern. Like, because ragged tensors aren't necessarily, or for a string, it's not necessarily that they're sparse. It's dense. Um, they just have varying lengths. So it would be good if we could say, hey, the first row has indices 0 through 5. The second row has indices 0 through 2. And those make up our sentences. Excuse me. And so um, that's what we did with ragged tensors. It's easy to create. Um, you just have a TF ragged constant to create it. Um, it's similarly built like a sparse tensor. It's made up of values and row splits. And so it minimizes the waste of uh, information. So you can see that all the values are in one tensor, and then we say where we want to split up that tensor to build up our different rows. Um, it's easier to kind of see it in this form, where the gray block on the left side is what the, rabbit, the ragged tensor is in its representation. And on the right is like how it would look represented. And down below is how you would um, actually do that call or build this if you're using values inside of TensorFlow. And so this was the original way we had row splits. Uh, we had some people come to us. They represented these um, in different ways. So we also provide row IDs where the ID um, tells where that value is inside your tensor. And row lengths um, that says uh, these are the lengths of each row. So. Um, you know, the first one takes the first four values. Um, you could have empty rows, so zero, two, and so on. And so we want to treat these like any normal tensor. Um, so ragged tensors, they have rank, just like you would see in normal tensors. Um, so in this example, we have a rank of two. They also have shape. Uh, the question mark when we find our shape is that denotes the ragged dimension. Um, it's not necessarily always on the end, uh, but in this case, um, it is on the end. Uh, and we can use uh, normal TensorFlow functions and ops like we would with normal tensors. And so here we're just using gather. It grabs the second and then the uh, first row. Uh, gather ND, which grabs the index. Concat. We can concat on the different axes. And of course, uh, you know, we made this for sequential and like text processing, so your string ops work well with ragged tensors. So here we uh, decode the strings into code points, encode them back into strings, and uh, conditionals work as well. So in this case, so where clause, um, where we use um, ragged tensors inside. Uh, the one case here is that the ragged tensors for the where, they must have the same uh, row split, so the, the rows must be of the same length. 
Um, and it's easy to convert into and out of ragged tensors. You can just do from tensor or from sparse uh, to create a ragged tensor. And then to move back, uh, you just have your ragged tensor and just call to tensor to sparse. And then to list out actually gives you a list if you want to print it out. Um, so we're also uh, adding support to Keras. Um, these are the layers that are currently available or compatible. And there's a lot left we have to do on this front. Um, so uh, we're pushing to get uh, more layers compatible with ragged tensors. Um, if you do are using them within your Keras model and come across something that's not compatible, uh, in TensorFlow text there at the bottom, we do provide a too dense layer that will just convert it for you. Uh, and the other, real cool thing that I want to point out is the RNN support. Um, so we've seen uh, on tests that we get 10% average speed up with like large batches, like 30% or more. Um, this is very exciting and you know, I won't go into details, but it's very intuitive because if you think about when you're in, at, you are looping through your tensor, you know when you're at the end of that ragged dimension, you can stop comp computation. Where before, if you're using tensors, you're using mask values, and masks can be not necessarily at the end, but in the middle, so you have to keep uh, computing until you're end of the full uh, tensor length or width. Um, so yeah, you just have a lot less computation, and so you save a lot there. All right. Um, so I want to go over a couple examples, show you how easy it is to work with. Um, you first, you can just install TensorFlow text but with pip. Um, our versions now map to TensorFlow versions. So if you're using TensorFlow 2.0, uh, use TensorFlow text 2.0. If you're using TensorFlow 1.15, uh, use TensorFlow text 1.15 uh, because of the custom ops, um, our versioning must match. And you can import it like this. Uh, we generally import TensorFlow text as text. So in these examples, you will see it written as text. So let's go over a basic preprocessor, what you might do. Uh, so normally, you'll get your in input text. Here we have a couple sentences. We want to tokenize it, uh, split those sentences into words. And then we want to map those uh, words into IDs inside our vocabulary that we'll feed into our model. And so the preprocess function might look like this, where we just instantiate the tokenizer, uh, create a ragged tensor of that input, and then map a table lookup into our vocabulary along the values of that ragged tensor. So uh, if you remember, uh, what the ragged tensor um, looked like underneath. When we have our words and tokens, uh, we have the ragged tensor above and where the values are set and then the row splits are separate in a separate tensor. So really when we want to like map those words to IDs, we, we're keeping the same shape. We only want to map over the uh, values. And so that's why the map over values is there because we're just converting we're doing the lookups on each word individually. And so the resulting ragged tensor is there at the end, and we can see what it actually represents above. And so this is our preprocessing. And once we're done, um, you using TF data, data, normally like create a data set from it. You map that preprocessing function over your data set. Um, I won't go into model details, but you can create a model with Keras pretty simply and then uh, fit that data set on the model, um, and that trains the model. And so you can use that same preprocessing function in your uh, serving input function. So you have the same preprocessing that's done at training time as it is in serving time with your inference. Uh, and this prevents training skew that we have seen multiple times in the past. I have, at least. Uh, so let's go over another example, uh, character bigram model here. Um, before I jump in, I just want to quickly go over n-grams. Uh, so a bigram is like a form of an n-gram with a width of two. Um, I, it's basically, I, I say, like a grouping of a fixed size over a series. 
Uh, we provide three different ways to join those together. So there's the, the string join, and you can sum values and also take averages. So let's pull an example here. Um, so here we're doing a bigram of words. Uh, so we have a sentence. We just tokenize it to split it up into words. And then we call the ngram function in TensorFlow text that groups those words together, which basically is joining a string. Um, so every two words are grouped together, as you can see. And so that's a, generally a bigram. So uh, trigrams is three. Um, so you can see here we split our sentence into characters, and then we group them together with every three characters. Um, we set the width to three. Uh, and then in this situation, the default is separator is a space, and so we just do the empty string. Um, so the other two, it also works with numbers. Um, so if we have a, a series here, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 is our tensor. We want to sum up every two numbers, so 2 plus 4 is 6, 4 plus 6 is 10, and so on. And then also average, uh, which is the mean reduction type. Um, so where this might, uh, generally when you talk about like n-grams, you are talking about it in a language context. Um, but where this would be helpful, let's say, you know, if you're taking like temperature readings every 20 minutes, and so you had a series of temperature readings every 20 minutes, but what you want to actually feed in your model is an average of those temperatures over an hour period every 20 minutes. You could do a trigram with a reduction of, uh, of mean. So it takes the average of those 20 minute intervals, and so you get uh, average temperature over the hour at every 20 minutes, and you can feed that into your model. Um, but generally, like I said, uh, uh, with the biograms and trigrams, it's, uh, it's often used in NLP, and um, how, how that works is you generally like split it up uh, either into words or characters, and then have a vocabulary dictionary you can look up those groupings in. Um, in our example, we cheat a little bit. Um, we get our, our code points uh, from our input. So here's, so we have this input. Um, we can get code points. Um, as you see again, uh, the rank is increased. So we had a shape of three, um, and then had a, now a shape of three with a ragged dimension. and. We use merge dimensions to actually combine those two dimensions, because we don't care about it in this case. Um, so it takes the second to last axis and the, the last axis and combines them. And then uh, we're just summing those up to create kind of our unique ID in this case that we'll feed into the model. Um, I think generally, like I said, you would do string joins and look those up in a vocabulary, but uh, for this case model, it works. And we just cast those values. Um, this is our preprocessing function that, again, uh, we create a data set using TF record data set, um, map our preprocessing function on those values, and then the model that's created, uh, we can train using this preprocessing function. All right, uh, finally, uh, I was going to go over uh, the BERT preprocessing. Um, there's a little bit more code in this one, so I just want to say that, like, you know, we provide the BERT tokenizer for you. Um, so feel, feel comfortable in knowing that you don't really have to write this if you don't want to. You can just use the BERT tokenizer tokenize, and it does all this stuff for you. Um, but I, I feel like there's a lot of good examples and like, what this does. And if you're doing text preprocessing, uh, pre um, these are things you should probably think about and know about. Um, so I wanted to go over it with you. So this is like a slim version of that. Um, so what it does, uh, what Bert did in his preprocessing, it lowercase to normalize the text, um, and then it did some basic tokenization. Um, it split out uh, Chinese characters and emoji um, by character splitting, and then it did word piece on top of all that. Um, so uh, with lowercase and normalizing, this is like very common that you would do um, when you're looking up words in your vocab, um, the, uh, you want the words to match and not have like duplicate words. So 
uh, capitalization kind of gets in the way with that. Um, you know, words at the beginning of a sentence are capitalized, so when you look it up, it would be like in your dictionary or vocabulary twice. And so it's generally thought that you would lowercase these. And normalization is um, a lot of Unicode characters um, with accents can be represented in different ways. And so normalization basically normalizes that text so it's represented in a single way and again, so you don't have the same word uh, multiple times in your vocabulary, um, which would confuse your model also um, as making your vocabulary larger. Uh, so we provide case fold, which is just an aggressive version of to lower. Um, what it does is it lowers, um, lowers lower cases characters. Uh, it also does, it works with non-Latin characters, um, accented characters. It doesn't mess up non-letters, so it keeps them as is, and does NFKC folding um, and normalization. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we do that in our first step. Um, I have examples of what this would look like. Um, so in this example, it really is just lowercasing our I and its. Um, and then BERT actually normalized to NFD, and because case fold does NFKC, we're gonna normalize to that next. Um, you know, I won't go over this, just know again that like letters have many different forms, so it's good to have like a single normalization, so when you're working with international characters, uh, they're not represented in different ways. So here we are, we just normalized to NFD. Now we're gonna do some basic tokenization. We'll split on Unicode scripts. Um, tokenize our text. Um, and then what you might notice here is while um, our sentence it's a trap has been tokenized, the Chinese characters have not. And that's because it's a single script throughout that whole sentence and there are no spaces or any other method of like defining uh, separations in words. So what we want to do is we want to like split that up. Um, so this is kind of like where a lot of code comes in. Um, you know, uh, you can follow. <laughs> and if I think the main point is just to know that like these things, um, you know, we've thought about, and if you run across it, there's like ways to work around this. Um, <laughs> I prepared you, tried to. Um, and it's, it's, it's simple ops when we step through it, you'll see. Um, so first, we just get your um, code points, or, um, sorry. Yes, we get code points of the characters. Uh, and then we just get script IDs of those characters, so you can see that the first sentence is all script 17, which um, is uh, Han script, which is Chinese. Um, and then our Latin characters are 25, and emoji and punctuation is zero. And we can just apply math.equal like you can on our ragged tensor. Um, it gives you, uh, and we're just checking if it's Han script, so we have true, and then we use the slice notation to just grab the first uh, character, because that's, we know they're all the same already from our Unicode script. Um, then we also want to check for emoji. Uh, in TensorFlow text, we provide a function word shape, um, which you can ask basically different questions on words, um, it, it's, it's basically like different regular expressions that you want to ask. So um, here we're asking, is this, does this uh, text have any emoji? Um, other ones is like, is there any punctuation? Uh, are there any numbers? Is my string all numbers? And so these are things you might want to like find out about uh, and provide you a method to do that. And so here we just, um, or our two uh, uh, conditions together to say whether we should split or not. Uh, it works with ragged. And then we go ahead and split everything into characters so that when we do our where clause and our conditional, if we should split or not, if we should split, we grab it from the characters that we've already split. If not, we just grab it from our tokens that we used when we tokenized. And here we just do a little uh, reformatting of, of how the shape looks. So once we've done that, can finally word piece tokenize. We provide it with our vocab table. Uh, we split it up um, into subwords. And we have an extra dimension, so we just get rid of that with merge nims. All right, we made, made it through that. <laughs> Wasn't too bad. Um, 
And so, you know, we apply this just as we did before. We have a, a data set we've created with TF data. We map our pre-processing across from that. Here we can grab the a classifier BERT model from the official BERT models and just train on that classifier. So I know that was a lot to go through. Uh, hopefully you followed along. Um, but the main thing to know is that, you know, as TF Text, uh, we're looking to uh, basically bring in all that pre-processing inside the graph so you don't have a problem. You don't have to worry about training skew. You can just uh, write your TensorFlow and train. And so we do that by giving you what I consider a superior data structure for uh, sequence data as well as text data through ragged tensors and the APIs uh, that are required for this pre-processing. Um, again, you can install it with pip install TensorFlow text. And thank you. Uh, here's some links. Uh, that's our GitHub. Uh, you know, if there's anything that you think is missing that we should add, feel free to add an issue. Um, and we also have a collab tutorial on tensorflow.org that um, you should check out, and it'll walk through some of this more slowly through a collab for you. Thanks. Oh yeah. We'll do that. Okay. Okay, so we still have uh, about seven minutes left, so we can open this up for Q and A. Um, there are some uh, microphones on either side, but I can also help provide those if needed. Um, do you want to go to the microphones? I grab these mics. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Very nice to see that you have all this support. Just a quick question: Does uh, can TF text handle uh, Japanese text? It's a mixture of hiragana, katakana, kanji, romanji, all thrown in. Really? Yeah. Um, so, um, like I, in this previous example where we go through the characters, there's a lot of, a lot of um, the core Unicode uh, we've added to core TensorFlow. Um, but when, uh, I don't know where we are in here. Um, so when we're searching for like the scripts, this is ICU, which is like the open source uh, library scripts, and so you can just as well like uh, grab that kanji, and they have different script tokens there. Thank you. Sure. Um, we'll just switch sides back and forth. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the information. For inferencing, <clears throat> do you send in text, or do you have to put it in a tensor and send it? Um, yeah, no, you can send text. So at inference time, like, and here the training, uh, we use this, like, preprocessing function. And so you can use that uh, same preprocessing function. When you save your model and save the model, you give it a serving input function uh, that basically does uh, preprocessing on your input. And so uh, if you send in, like, those full string sentences, um, you can use the same function or a variation of that and that input function, and so it should process. Okay. Thank you. Simple. Sure. Back over here. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. And my question kind of relates to his question. So what's the advantages of applying it with a map versus having a layer that does it? Because you could, even with a lambda layer or with the new RFC for preprocessing layer, have a layer that does it? Um, Oh, a, a layer that does the preprocessing? Yeah, it just applies yeah. that function and then it's saved as a checkable as part of the model? Um, yeah, no, you, you, could, you could certainly do um, some of this with layers. Um, actually, you know, we're looking at like what layers we should provide. Uh, and someone on our team is helping Keras in uh, building out like their preprocessing layer, which is basic. And if there's added functionality that we find that people need, uh, we'll supply it for um, in, our, in our TensorFlow text library. So it's really up to you as someone who wants to model it, like how you want to apply those. Thank you for the talk. Sure. Um, two quick questions. The first one is, um, do the tokenizers that you provide also have a decoding function so that you go from the tokens, uh, from the integers to the sequence of text? And the integers, uh, yeah, those TF strings Unicode decode. Is that what you're talking about from code points? Or are you? 
then talking about, so for instance, if, if you decode them in, for instance, with a BERT uh, vocabulary, then you will have all these um, um, oh. additional characters there, and then you want to concatenate them into, again, a sequence of text that's proper text, right? Yeah, so you're, um, I think what you're asking is, um, so if you uh, send your word through a BERT model and you get a vector representation, if you can translate that vector representation back to text? Yeah, because that's the case when you, for instance, generate text. And so then you may want to map that text back, like the sequence of generated tokens back into a string of text. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, more along the lines of kind of like, I think you want like an encoder decoder model, like there's models that do this. Uh, it's not something that is like we provide inside the library. Uh, that, well, we can take it flying. It's like a slightly different question. Uh, the second question is why this, this is not in TensorFlow? Um, yeah. Um, so um, with 2.0, I mean, you might know that like TensorFlow has gotten rid of contrib, and it's kind of for the core team has gotten unhand like unhandily, or it's it's too much to handle. The um, tests are running too long, and it's really like it's too much for one team to maintain. And so, um, you know, I, I think we'll see more um, kind of uh, modules like TensorFlow Text to, um, that are like focused on one particular area like this. Um, as a team, like we want to make it easier across. So a lot of the stuff we've done, like with ragged tensors, um, some of the string ops are actually in core TensorFlow. Um, but for some of these things that are, like, are outside the scope, um, like engrams uh, and tokenization, um, it's just a separate module. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Go ahead. So since TF text it can be incorporated into the TensorFlow graph, is it intended that you actually build a model with this preprocessing step? And if true, like what are are there like performance implications and like TensorFlow serving? If that's there, if that's has that been measured, and yeah, um, there's there's definitely like um, some performance. Um, I think, you know, it's it's done at the input level. Um, I'm just gonna skip that to right here. So it's done at the input. Um, so this is actually a pro uh, a problem that TF Data is looking at as far as like um, consuming this data. Um, and then parallelizing, parallelizing. Right. I said this wrong earlier today too. <laughs> parallelizing these like input functions, and so if you're um, actually your models on GPU or TPUs, right. like the the inputs parallelized, and then you're feeding as much data as possible. So this is like something you might uh, worry about and look at, um, but it's also what a lot of other people are looking at. Hoping okay, at. and then uh, yeah, I guess. If, if it's part of the TensorFlow graph in TensorFlow serving, like how are like the nodes out allocated and computed, right? Like it's pre-processing on the CPU or like... Yeah, right? most of this is done on the CPU. Okay. I would say all of it. <laughs> can, yeah. can I just quick, quickly ask, um, oh. are you compatible with TF2? Because I, I just pip installed TensorFlow text and it uninstalled TensorFlow 2 and installed 1.14. Um, so if you did, so like I said, the um, versions need to match. If you um, just do pip install uh, tensorflow text equals equals 2.0.0, which I think uh, maybe why it did that is because that version is actually a release candidate. So just do RC0. Um, it'll reinstall tensorflow 2 for you. Okay. Um, so yeah. Right. Sure. Uh, last question. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that this is really cool. Second is that um, do, do TF.txt integrate with other NLP libraries such as like Spacey or anything in that area? Just out of curiosity. Um, no, our focus is really just on TensorFlow right now. Okay. 